Hi, folks. Thanks for coming. Um, I don't have any slides. I don't have memes, although that is my love language. So I am sad that I missed that opportunity. But I do have dad jokes, so we'll see if any of those come out. Um, <clears throat> My talk is about information advantage. I'm not really going to talk about that directly. You will get that as a result of me indirectly hitting on that uh, throughout my talk. I, I couldn't have planned this better, that fight about whether you should be on the private side or the government side. As I was developing my talking points, I actually landed on opportunities to support global and national security. Um, things are changing in a really awesome way. And I've been on the island of misfit toys for a long time. So at the very end of their chat, when they were talking about how you could hop in and hop out of either government industry or into government jobs, I think that's a new phenomenon. Usually, um, I would say a decade ago, maybe even 20 years ago, if you were a government civilian, you signed up for life. And that was your choice, and that was it. That was the only road for you. And I think the really important thing, if you get nothing else from this talk, is that the borders are permeable now in a way that they never have been before. And that's really exciting. It's a benefit to industry. It's also a benefit to government. There's obvious benefits to government bringing in that fresh blood, that new technical expertise to help us solve the most challenging problems on the planet, dealing with data you're never going to encounter anywhere else, dealing with challenges and problems that you'll never see anywhere else. Um, and that's why my talk changed, actually, because I would tell you about it, but then I'd have to kill you, and I think that's not a good look for the Linux Foundation. Um, so um, when I started at RSOF, um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit about me going back to that permeable border. I started in government service. I actually was a mathematician for the Navy. I was a mathematician because it, data science wasn't a thing yet. So when I say island of misfit toys, I mean I started there. Um, and I started in math. Actually, I was a theater major. So I came late to the math game. Um, so I really never fit into any bucket. But when I started at um, the Navy, I really learned a lot about these cool missions. And I was very driven to help solve these challenging problems. Um, I did more government service. I was in the government for 13 years doing data science in lots of different formats. I actually learned uh, machine learning on the job. A PhD in physics was teaching it in a, just an informal learning group that we called Rage Against the Machine Learning. Um, and we did, man. We learned. We worked our way through um, the Bengio Corville book um, cover to cover and, and worked through these textbooks in a very educational format. So the really cool thing about working in government is both your access to these interesting data sets and challenging problems, but also your ability to learn on the job. So when they talk about these mid to early career, um, it is a great opportunity. You get a lot of exposure that you never would have gotten. So you, if you make a decision to work on the industry side for government, or you make a decision to be a civilian or put on a green suit and uh, be in the Army, those are all variable paths. There's a lot of variety in that now. So for RSOF, if, if anybody saw uh, General Roberson's talk, I'm not going to go too deep on the origins, but some really cool, interesting facts. The origins of RSOF are the Office of Strategic Services. That was 1942 to 1945. They had two very distinct missions, both to collect, analyze, and disseminate information. That later became the CIA and then also to conduct unconventional warfare. And that is like the genesis of RSOF. Uh, they work by, with, and through other people. Um, and that is really how, who they are as a people. Now, their goals are to be globally postured. They want this, if you've heard of the Green Berets, that's who I'm working with every day, or Green Berets. Um, their position in the last decade in 135 of 195 of the recognized countries in the world. So they are literally everywhere, which is really cool. You learn a lot um, working with them, both their understanding of culture and of people, and also their deep respect and need to satisfy the mission. Uh, their motto is De Oppresso Liber, which is to free the oppressed. And I think that's definitely a worthy goal for us. So one thing I will say working in the government is that that is so mission driven. And a lot of people have a misconception if they've never worked in the government before that government service is old school in a way that maybe there's not a lot of diversity. I will say being government and then going industry, I worked at Microsoft for four and a half years um, after some of my 13 years of government service. That's not the case. We are so mission focused. We're really concerned about the GSD factor. If you're not familiar with that, that's getting 
stuff done. Um, <laughs> and if you can GSD, then it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter your race. We are working against something so much more important. Um, and so I would really make sure that, uh, again, if you know nothing about this from my talk, is that the opportunities just continue to vary and grow. Um, we have hackathons. Someone had asked that in General Roberson's talk. Uh, there are hackathon opportunities. There are also opportunities for small businesses. So if you're a startup company, again, you can work on the industry side. There's a thing called SBIR, S-B-I-R.gov. Um, and then there's uh, some other acronyms about technology technology transition programs as well. So there's, they're throwing a lot of money to make sure that we are the ones leveraging technology the greatest way that we can so that we can make sure we're protecting people's rights and their ability to live freely. So that's really the heart of the mission. Um, what does that have to do with open source? Uh, Interesting, again, we have government use applications. Both PyTorch and Kubernetes are two great examples from the Linux Foundation. But has anyone known about government contributions to open source? Again, this is a misconception that always we're taking, taking, taking from industry. In fact, we also give back. And so two examples of that are Apache Cumulo. Accumulo is a key value store, and this allows you to have a robust and scalable way to both store and retrieve information. It's powerful tooling for you. Also, Apache NiFi, this is a data workflow so that you can do ETL pipelines there. So those are contributions actually from the government. Um, I know Accumulo came from NSA. I'm, I can't remember NiFi, where that came from. But the interesting thing is we're also looking for new opportunities to produce these things and give them to the open source community to ensure that they continue continue to thrive and grow, and even be used in ways that we never would have imagined in the beginning. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about, the reason that this is such an interesting time for us to have these opportunities, the DOD is producing CTO and CDO roles across all echelons and all organizations. That gives us a fighting hope to work against some of those memes where bureaucracy was slow and brittle and frustrating and you'd never see the progress. We are really seeing a lot of policy, contractual, um, and bureaucratic changes being made because these CDO and CTO roles are be ta being taken seriously. Our report to a two-star general, directly, there is no one in between me and him. So he gets to say, A, what my authorities are, and B, whether or not I'm doing a good job. That empowers me to help drive them um, in a more modern direction. And a result of one of those things is I wrote a remote, remote work policy. They have a lot of problems with um, you know, some of these kind of stereotypical government roles taking advantage of telework as a result of COVID. And so there's lots of jokes and memes about that. But the folks that really GSD, if you want to get it done, um, Telework and remote work is pivotal. It's key. It's the only way we're going to actually be able to tap into the exceptional talent that is stored in the open source community. So I, again, I just wrote that policy. Um, I'm publishing it. It's going to be part of our C office of the CTO as we grow. We'll be publishing jobs. If you're interested in government jobs, usajobs.gov is the place to go look. Um, and if you're interested in supporting through industry, X-Tech is another example of how small businesses can contribute. But there's hackathons, I see communities, even NGA is sponsoring hackathons. So in any small way or large way, or even if you're just supporting the open source community, and that is the foundation by which we generate this global and, and national security, you're doing your part. So I want to thank you for that. Um, uh, we also have more unclassified work and uh, diversity. I mentioned that if you saw General Roberson's talk, he even talked about women in RSOF. They are really uh, working hard to make sure that this is the right place for people that are talented, that want to be. They want to make modifications as something as simple as armor modifications so that their uh, bulletproof vest is more comfortable. That seems trivial, and yet that makes the quality of life so much better uh, for the women that are in RSOF. Um, again, I will just say that a lot of the CTO roles that I know across DOD and the IC have been filled by women. Um, so I think this is necessary for us to have a really good posture in leveraging technology well, not just women, uh, uh, people of color, both women and men, and then also anyone else that represents a diverse quality. Um, and diversity, in fact, it doesn't even just encompass these outward physical features. It's also how we're educated. I'm a mathematician. 
I'm working next to a physicist and an engineer, that, that's the quality that we want in the products. Now, if you're on a truly diverse team, it will create friction. And so then we have to wrestle through that because if we have a diverse team that we say, hey, hey we're diverse, but everybody's getting along, we're fooling ourselves. Real, true diversity and the benefits and values that come from that will create friction. And so we're finding ways to work through that. <clears throat> Uh, and some of the new policies that DOD is generating, Vaultus, if you're familiar with that, that is uh, in their data strategy to make data visible, accessible, understandable, linked, trusted, interoperable, and secure. Just like the government, we made it a little too complicated. An easier way to put that, if you're familiar with the FAIR data standards, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, that's a more concise way to say it. But the thing is, they're generating policies to create an environment for change at the highest levels. Now they're empowering people at every echelon, CTOs and CDOs, to start to poke and prod at these processes and bureaucracies that need to change so that the RMF framework, we can work through that and break down those boundaries. I'm finding all the friction points so that I can go highlight them and say, hey, General Ferguson, we gotta do something about this. The first thing I did in my role is I identified the need for digital literacy as a blanket requirement for every person in the first Special Forces Command. I got flack for that. Uh, one of the folks, um, I, I won't say who, uh, I'll protect his name, but um, one of the folks in the leadership team and our command team said, surely, Amanda, you don't mean every person, like the guy that's fueling the tank or something. I'm like, that's exactly what I mean. Everyone needs to invest in their digital literacy, both because it decays um, and then also because the technology is changing year over year. So regardless of how good we are or not good we are, this is something we have to invest in. So I formalized that and codified it in our 350-1. And now every single person in the RSOF command has to take digital literacy training of some kind annually. Um, and, and this could include, hey, how do we get stuff through the RMF framework? How do we ensure that our stuff is secure and yet not creating so many boundaries that we're just never procuring new software or making advances in the way that we should? So this is going to create um, an environment where we can move even faster. I've also been working a lot with our command team and making sure that they themselves are digitally literate. There's nothing more frustrating than having a digitally capable staff that reports to leadership that has no idea the value that they add. So we're breaking down those barriers. Uh, at the same time, we're creating career pathways for people, both green suitors and civilians. Civilians, excuse me, <clears throat> civilians even have um, AI engineer as a title. Uh, let's go back a few years when I was a mathematician, right? I mean, come on, that's a really exciting advancement. So we're trying to create the same things for the green suitors so that they are honored and valued for the skill sets that we're up here fighting for to make sure that we can reward. Because in the current system um, and in the older system, it was difficult to promote people because they would miss out on key opportunities to do technical work. Um, and so now we're trying to make sure that this is an environment where they're rewarded for that. Um, I also wanted to talk about how the battle space is expanding. So the, the data sets are really interesting. We're encountering new problem sets all the time. Um, and then I'll give an open source example. So I did find this on open source, so no one has to worry. Uh, Ukraine, we talked about that. General Roberson talked about that. We talked about drones and robotics. This makes the front lines both more lethal and more difficult for us to surprise because we're sensing everywhere. And it creates a highly distributed and resilient kill chain. So it's a really threatening environment environment that we're operating in, and whether or not we want to do that, our intent is to be prepared if something kicks off. Our intent is to solve some of these things left of conflict so that hopefully we don't have to get into conflict. But I'll give one example to close out. Um, for drones, the, this would maybe inspire you in your open source work. You could have a high-flying drone out here identifying a target. They come and they identify a target. You can send a second drone out that's cheaper, a little bit lower flying, and they can verify, yes, that's the target that we thought it was. We have a little bit better resolution. The third drone could now move out and acquire targeting data, get even closer. Maybe it's even cheaper because now we're even more in dangerous territory. And then that can either be leveraged through a kamikaze drone. Hey, it just crashes, crashes straight into it. We've seen that on the Ukrainian battlefield. Or now we can leverage information that we gained and that information advantage that we gained, send it back to a howitzer to deliver precision fire from what's 
generally considered an uh, imprecise indirect fire. So now we're changing our whole ecosystem of how we're fighting. Uh, the second drone could then be sent back out to do battle damage assessment to understand, did we actually kill that target or did we merely immobilize it and we need to go for another round? So this just gives you a bit of a, a vignette of how these technologies have evolved. Um, and this battle space is just a snapshot in time. In six months, I've seen a lot of change of how these types of engagements are changing the battle space. But that's expanding. And when I say expanding, I mean we have to adopt all of these new practices while still not uh, losing our ability to affect change and targets in a traditional manner. And so it's just continually expanding. And I think that is one really exciting place to start to make a difference and make sure that we keep our loved ones safe um, and global security safe. Uh, that's all for my talk. I'd love to have questions if we're not up against any time limits. I didn't get a no, so let's go. Any questions? Yes. What sort of deficits did you monitor to what your literacy was indicative? Say again? What sort of deficits did you monitor to what your literacy Oh, that's a great question. What uh, deficiencies did we find in digital literacy? I think it's more the variants that I found. We had pockets of people that were innovating in ways that I haven't encountered in industry. And then they were juxtaposed by people that when I said cloud, they would glaze over. And so that creates a, a less effective environment. And if we want to be a truly lethal force, if we truly want to prevent that conflict from coming, we need everyone to raise their capabilities. We need to be able to say cloud and have detailed conversations with decision makers that were, if they have a 30-year career, cloud was not around for most of it. And so we have to make sure that when we have these discussions, we are able to get over to them the importance and the detail, because the devil is always in the detail. The plans, everybody can say, amen, hell yes, Vaultus, we want that data that way. But the challenge is in implementing it well, and that's where we usually get it wrong. And it's often because decision makers, people that have been in the role for so long, don't have the depth they need or understand the implications of the decisions they're making. And so we're trying to right that ship. And the beautiful thing is I've seen change in just eight months of being on the job. I've been able to provide a lot of analogies to make that information sticky. So the analogy I provided them is, hey, I've been a data scientist almost my whole career. Then I manage data scientists, and they have the same problems. You employ me. You want me to imagine I'm a mechanic. I don't have a garage. I don't have a car to work on. And I don't have any tools. What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> or you have a garage, but you have no car. The car being data, the tools being our access to open source tools that are so critical to our daily job, and then the garage, obviously, an environment to work in. So the nice thing is I hear them parrot back, well, what are you going to do if you don't have a garage and tools to work in? I'm like, you got it. So now they start to understand when I leverage things and I say things like a Python library, now they're starting to go, OK, what's that again? That's, that's part of my tools package. I don't have tools. OK, I understand immediately the importance and the value of getting that for you. So um, it's changing conversations, and it's creating an environment where we can make the changes we need to so that we can have the information advantage that we desire. Thanks for the question. Yeah, I'll start at the top. I could tell you and I have to kill you. No, uh, um, they do exist. I think the beautiful thing is, like I said earlier, we're in this environment where as soon as we highlight something like that, I literally have a direct line. He's on my cell phone. I call him, General Ferguson, you have to pay attention to this. And he takes it seriously. I don't think that's an environment that we've had for very long. Um, certainly not at this echelon before I started in July. Um, there are a handful of trusted advisors that he's had that if they give him technical information, he would trust it. Um, but it's nice having it funnel in one place so we can deconflict and we can start to provide oversight and guidance, professionalize those pockets of excellence, propagate that across the force. So there's a lot of really good motion that's happening. Um, and so I'm, I'm encouraged by that connective tissue. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. The digital literacy isn't just a thing we have to teach, it's a cultural change. I'm curious if you can share any yes. tips, tricks. Uh, yes, this is a paid advertisement. I will pay you later. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and the interesting thing is sometimes the most pivotal advancements can be very unsexy. So some of the things that we've done is create an ability for our general to see himself better. Who's peeing in a cup? So compliance. Who's peeing in a cup and taking drug tests? Who's got their you know, health records straight? Who's taking their fitness test? Who's been passing that? So they can start to see all of these compliance metrics to make sure that we are green where we need to be green. And wherever we're yellow or red, we can apply pressure directly there. Now, that sounds small, but that's a huge effort because the data sources exist at an authoritative level. So in order to engage and make change, we're talking to the Army. The Department of the Army is huge, right? And so that doesn't happen just by me. That happens because I exist. I can apply pressure on my general. I also can call the USASOC CDO. He can call the SOCOM CDO. We, we are all pushing in the same direction, and that's why I'm really excited about the opportunities, both for industry, both informally through hackathons, and then also if you were interested in being a government civilian for a short period of time, I think you'd find it really awesome. So thank you for that question. Yes. One question, I, and I, I think you might know this, but I need to know. You're, you're, you're in a privileged position. The general that spoke, privileged position. One of the things that I, I feel like being in the government and being, especially in the military, is that we don't, we don't do the basics really well from IT perspective. And so you know, it's great to talk about digital transformation and all that stuff, but if people can't, if a soldier and Agreed. And, and then, but at the same time, you have general officers and SESs that have, they have a whole you know, uh, uh, commander comm team that basically briefs all those things. Yeah. Together. And so they're, it's like having their own parking spot next to this building. They don't understand what it's like to actually walk a half a mile to the base, right? So those are things that I don't know if you're looking at that as part of your pay. So. Yeah, this is great. So this is the right conversation to have. I would say digital, every time I have a conversation, it's like all roads lead back to digital literacy. So what the heck does digital literacy have to do with that? Um, have you ever gone to a florist shop? You, maybe some of you have, haven't. But if you go to a florist shop and you order flowers, they're one price. If they are bridal flowers, they are double or triple that price. In the government, instead of DevOps, it's DevSecOps. Well, if you're doing DevOps right, SEC is included. And so part of this is a vocabulary conversation. We need to be big boys and big girls and say what it is and mean what we say because if we define it differently, we're gonna get caught in that buzzword trap where we get charged triple for the same thing that we had at home. No, we have DevOps at home. No, no, we don't need any of that. We've got MLOps at home. Oh, but it, it's this AI and it's like more and more AI. It's like, it's because digital literacy is pivotal at all echelons for us to be able to truly move forward, get those real conversations out of the way, because they don't, you're right, a lot of them don't understand the pain. The beauty of it is I grew up a data scientist in the government, I lived the pain myself, and my pain might be a little different because it's older pain, I'm not that old, if you're wondering. No. <laughs> um, but, but I understand it enough to represent it and be able to ask the right detailed questions to help a commander assess and understand what level of risk he's incurring because he doesn't understand enough to have the right conversation at the right time. So that's, that's a great question. Yes? Yeah. Frequently, a lot of the time, those readers didn't actually work correctly. So, like on one side, we need digital literacy, but we also need to uh, invest more in just basics for IT. For yeah, totally agree. Yeah. So I'm I'm the conduit that that information is coming through. That.
yeah, that's why I'm excited about the creation of these new roles because now they have a conduit to push that information. Where they have a leadership that has privileged power that actually understands what they're saying and can do something about it. So appreciate your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.